Greetings, everyone, and welcome to another Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News webinar. Our presentation today is entitled Design, Characterization, and Scale-Up Strategy for a New Single-Use Production Scale Bioreactor. I'm Jeff Bogaliskis, Technical Editor for GEN, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar presentation. Single-use bioprocessing systems have seen a tremendous growth in popularity over the past several years due to their numerous advantages over legacy equipment. Now that single-use biocontainers can be supplied pre-sterilized, engineers can consider novel shapes that break from traditional designs and offer added benefits for both growth conditions and modularity. Let's meet our speakers for this gym webinar who will describe the engineering concepts and advantages of the Allegro STR square cross-section design bioreactor, as well as provide scale-up growth data from live mammalian cell cultures. Dr. Alan Nino, Emeritus Professor of Biochemical Engineering at the University of Birmingham in the UK, will begin the presentation by informing us about some of the considerations and methodologies that are required for scale-up growth conditions for single-use bioprocessing systems. Dr. Nino will be followed by Byron Rees, a Senior R&D Manager of Cell Culture Applications at Paul Life Sciences, who will provide us with real-world data from scaled-up batch cultivations of CHO cells using the Allegro STR bioreactor. Before we get rolling into Alvin's presentation, I want to encourage everyone in the audience to submit questions for a Q&A session at the end of the presentations. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can, so simply type your question into the Q&A box on the left-hand side of your screen and hit submit. Additionally, keep an eye out for a couple brief polling questions that will show up during the presentations. Just click your appropriate answer and away we'll go. Don't worry, though, I'll be back on to remind you when the questions come up. All right, with all the particulars out of the way, let's get our webinar started. Alvin, the audience is listening. I want to tell you today about my work with Paul on the design and characterization of a range of new single-use production-scale bioreactors. Let me introduce myself. I'm Alvin Nino. Um, I'm an Emeritus Professor of Biochemical Engineering at the University of Birmingham, which you can see here. And um, in addition, I'm a visiting professor at the University of Loughborough, which is quite close by, in the middle of England, and the University of Aston, which is also in Birmingham. And I've worked for many years on mixing associated with bioprocessing and bioreactors. And throughout this, the, the work that's led to this development, I've collaborated with the Paul Company who are on the south coast of England at Portsmouth, at the bottom of the map. The lecture is divided into um, a number of topics. So we introduce, introduce a topic, then uh, we go through the system engineering concepts because there are many aspects that have to be taken into account. Then the process engineering considerations, what really goes on inside the biocontainer, um, the uh, establishing of the various uh, operating units, the values at the 200 liter scale, and then the scale up to the 1,000 and 2,000 liter, and I should add that there's also work going on developing a 50 liter. And then my colleague Byron will tell you a little bit about how the results of the results that have been obtained using Cho cells um, to produce protein. So, oh, by way of introduction, it's well known now that single-use components and systems have been incorporated into many pharmaceutical processes as an alternative to cleanable, reusable systems. And there are many reasons for this, and they've largely become accepted. So they're particularly useful for increased flexibility, especially at contract manufacturing organizations. You get enhanced sterility insurance because everything is pre-sterilized, which eliminates cleaning in place and also steaming in place. So it's a lot of time saved there. Um, there's reduced capital investment because none of the extra piping and so on is required. And that gives you faster processing times and particularly faster startup and facility flexibility. So you can change things around very easily.
once we're dealing with complex systems like bioreactors, there's an opportunity for innovative design that could provide enhanced performance um, at, over the traditional stainless steel bioreactors. But of course, at the same time, it's important to make use of the special features that, that stirred tank bioreactors have in terms of their flexibility and the large uh, knowledge of the way that they behave with different agitation conditions and sparging rates. So a well-designed single-use bioreactor is based on systems engineering principles to ensure robust and reliable performance. In other words, that it has to take into account the expertise of bioprocess engineers, mechanical engineers, production engineers, and particularly, in addition, control engineering to make sure that the uh, bioreactor is, can hold the right dissolved oxygen and pH and so on. And um, it has to be set up in such a way that it's easy to use a lot, utilize, so that requires uh, proper ergonomic considerations too for efficient operator uh, usage. Now the shape of the traditional bioreactor is cylindrical with dished ends, and that's because essentially it was needed to carry out steam sterilization, and therefore it had to be a pressure vessel. And all pressure vessels are made in this way in order to maximize their strength for the material that is used to make them. So if you're using expensive stainless steel, you don't want to use more than necessary, and the traditional cylinder with dished ends minimizes the amount of material. But once you go to pre-sterilized systems, then you can choose to use different shapes, and you can take into account other factors. Paul have a lot of experience of building uh, single-use polymeric film bags, and they have found that you can get superior stability if you make them of a square cross-section. <clears throat> they be easier to fold, uh, protect, and package prior to shipping, and then when you ship them, they maintain a higher integrity and are less likely to be damaged. And in addition, for a bioreactor, the distinct faces make it easy to install into the support steel hardware. So the, the bioreactor is designed to prevent impact between the biocontainer film and other system components, <coughs> and in particular, that means a bottom-mounted impeller, um, because that, that ensures a compact and protective package, packaging can be designed, and the impeller and components do not damage the biocontainer. In addition, it has single-use sensors, so there's less opportunity for damage as a result of sensors intruding into the package or in transit, and it eliminates installation costs, cleaning, sterilization, and calibration is already done. The particular bioreactor we have designed also has bellows available for aseptic insertion, so other uh, probes can be installed. We see some pictures that illustrate rather nicely how compact everything is, arriving in a box. The box is then removed. You can see again how it's very tightly held together. And then you see two personnel uh, putting the biocontainer into the steel outer structure. It's all uh, relatively easy. And because it's relatively easy, it's easy to install correctly every time without the risk of damage. You see the bioreactor assembly, the Allegro uh, series that we have. Um, this is the 200 liter. <coughs> it shows the, um, in particular, things like the controller with a touch screen, the uh, motor at the bottom to drive it. You can see the impeller. Um, you can see the position of the sensor ports, utility ports with color tags, for easy identification, and so on. Then there's the load cell and electric heater at the base. A very well system engineering designed bioreactor. 
All right, everyone, as I mentioned earlier, here's the first of our few polling questions that we have. For what applications are you using or looking to use a single stirred tank bioreactor? To select the appropriate answers below. All right, let's continue with the presentations. Alvin? And now let's get on to the process engineering considerations, which is the area where I specialize. And one must recognize that the use of baffles in the cylindrical bioreactor is absolutely critical to make stirred bioreactors efficient in relation to mixing. If they're not baffled, which many single-use bioreactors are not, then you get a strong swirling flow, which may look as though it's giving good mixing, but in fact, the mixing is poor, especially from top to bottom. If the system is baffled, then more power can be put in, top to bottom mixing is better as a result of that power, and it also can enable higher rates of mass transfer to be achieved. Now that's achieved here by means of the square shape. The square shape acts as a sort of baffling, and the baffles themselves have been incorporated by making protrusions come in from the support structure. And you can see that very clearly in this diagram. Um, so as a result of that, you get this a much improved performance compared to baffles. Um, the impeller choice is also important, and here there's a, an upward flow impeller is, is being used. And the advantage of this, again, well established in many tests and very common now in aerated bioreactors, is an up pumping impeller, which um, ensures that the power input when the system is aerated is almost identical with that unaerated. You get stable flow patterns and air can be dispersed at quite high rates. And the combination of these effects gives you high KLA. That's improved even more by using a large impeller diameter relative to the uh, size of the bioreactor, the diameter of a cylindrical one or the side length of a square one. And again, this gives better blending and homogeneity, especially important when feeding nutrients and undertaking pH control. The impeller itself is placed a quarter of the vessel height when it's completely full, and this again ensures good dispersion of gas, of the air, and also helps achieve a wide range of working volumes from 60 to 200 liters. The power input from the impeller goes up to about a third of a watt per kilogram, and that's higher than generally available in most single-use bioreactors, and it means that a high KLA can be achieved, able to meet the highest cell density cultures. This sort of power input uh, has been shown to maintain equivalent higher cell density and protein quality compared to lower power input. So it not only uh, is able to grow uh, to higher concentrations because of the auction demand that can be met by the high power, but it does it successfully. And the impeller shape is very similar to that used in large-scale stainless steel bioreactors, often called elephant ear impellers and considered low shear. When it comes to aeration, the sparging, the critical feature here is the CO2 stripping. Getting more oxygen in is very easy and is often done by using um, sint sintered sparges. And these are, are more likely to cause damage. They give high oxygen transfer, but they don't strip the CO2. So here there are flow rates up to 0.2 VVM with an open pipe or ring sparger. There's no velocity through the holes that's high enough to cause damage. Um, and because the bubbles that are produced are relatively large, then there is uh, no damage uh, from bubbling. And so we get uh, high KLAs uh, which with high PCO2 stripping. And that reduces the tendency to foaming um, too.
Interestingly enough, there are a couple of other uh, features. The impeller has a blade angle of 45 degrees, and if the motor is reversed and it is turned into a down-pumping impeller, then it becomes very efficient for suspending microcarriers. And so though it's not been developed specifically with that in mind, there is considerable potential for using the Allegro series for growing cells on microcarriers, uh, whether it's for stem cells or cells for therapeutic proteins. And the square shape gives you another advantage. The volume that, that uh, you get into a particular height is greater, and so it's easier to put the equipment into a smaller space. You get a higher surface area to volume ratio, so there's a potential for higher uh, surface mass transfer. And because the height is reduced, the homogeneity at the top is also enhanced. So a range of extra features that come from the square shape. So now what about some uh, measurements to substantiate the aims that have been introduced in designing the bioreactor? Here we've used CFD to do two things. First of all, to show that the flow pattern obtained in the square single-use bioreactor is very similar to that achieved in a similar volume uh, cylindrical bioreactor. So this is the cubical bioreactor flow pattern, and this is the uh, cylindrical. You can see they're very similar. And you can also see that if you compare the cylindrical results from the current work with some earlier work involving uh, PIV measurements of the flow patterns together with CFD, you see they all are in pretty good agreement. And the strong recirculating flow that gets down below the impeller is the one that gives good gas dispersion, even though the uh, impeller is effectively pumping upwards. Another important parameter is the power number or the specific power put into the system. Again, two comparisons. This is the CFD prediction of the power input with the cubical shape and the cylindrical shape. And you can see they're in very good agreement. And on the, on the right, you can see there is a comparison between the measured torque and the, uh, that predicted by CFD. And we also find that the power number predicted between, uh, by CFD compares very favorably with that from the um, torque measurements made experimentally. KLA, uh, sorry, mixing time is another important feature. And again, the same comparison are made. On the left, you see the um, comparison of the mixing time in a, a cubical and a cylindrical vessel, and they're very similar. And on the right, you see the comparison between the measurements using conductivity probes and the addition of a, of a salt solution with the CFD predictions of the mixing time. And you see that, uh, the, the, again, the predictions are really rather good. And uh, the correlation for the, uh, this mixing time fits in very well with the correlations already available in the literature for cylindrical vessels. The final aspect of the, uh, th this work was the mass transfer and the... Um, KLA is proportional to the specific power to a typical exponent, just a bit higher than the square root relationship, and that is, as I say, typical, uh, but it gets to very high values compared to other single-use bioreactors. And this is, uh, has been measured in a simulated media with bicarbonate buffer, pleuronic, and um, some antifoam at a particular air flow rate. The higher air flow rate will give you slightly higher KLAs than those shown here. The CO2 stripping rate has also been measured by following the fall of pH as one strips out the CO2, and the stripping rates have been calculated, and again, they're very high, so this should be very effective for high-density cell culture, 
and that will be shown shortly. So the parameters that eventually have materialized for the 200 litre bioreactor are shown on the, in this table, and I particularly draw to your notice the power input of 0.31 watts per kilogram, um, the airflow rate of 0.2 VVM, and a KLA up to about 33 per hour. Um, at the 1,000 litre, slightly higher KLA values are obtained, rather similar uh, specific powers, um, and at the 2,000, the specific power is a little lower, but because of the VVM leads to high superficial gas velocity, the KLAs are very similar across all three scales. So altogether, we have three bioreactors capable of producing the amount of dissolved oxygen that's needed by high KLA uh, and high sparge rate for stripping out the CO2 and for doing that under well-controlled conditions at the same time as giving good mixing because of the particular flow patterns developed by the impeller uh, and square shape. So I'll finish there, and shortly my colleague uh, Byron will tell you about the success in growing cells. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. That was a great presentation. You provide our audience with valuable considerations that are necessary when scaling up cell culture. So we thank you for that. Uh, I want to remind everyone once again to submit questions for our Q&A session after the next presentation. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can to simply type your question into the Q&A box on the left-hand side of your screen and hit submit. All right. So before we dive into Byron's presentation, we have one more polling question for you. Uh, that question is, what is your preferred criteria for scale-up? I'll give everyone a few seconds to click the appropriate answer. All right, and with that, Byron, the floor is yours. So hello, everyone. Um, my name is Byron Rees. Um, I'm the um, manager of the applications group for Paul um, here in the UK. Um, and I'm going to present just a, a very short summary on um, some of the work we've done to characterize scalability within the Paul STR systems. So for this first slide, um, this is the overview of the experiment. We've started by gathering all the characterization data we'd obtained for each of the bioreactor systems in the test to determine what our scale-up strategy would be. And we were going from a benchtop um, sort of a PD scale vessel um, up to a manufacturing scale, which is the POL systems of 200 and 1,000 liter production. So for this test, we chose a Cho cell line producing a monoclonal antibody. Um, the optimal chemically defined growth medium was determined from earlier shake class studies. And the process we're actually running is in batch mode. Um, we used a concentrated glucose solution for feed only. The optimal agitation and gassing strategy was determined in 10 liter glass um, SDR vessels. And we chose an agitation speed of 190 RPM, which is equivalent to a power input of 100 watts per meter cubed. And this was shown to produce um, the desired cell numbers and product types as we know this process was capable of. This combined with an aeration rate of 1.3 liters per minute produced a KLA of approximately seven reciprocal hours. So for the scale up to 200 liters and 1,000 liters in the Paul uh, Allegro bioreactors, we considered several factors to determine what agitation and gassing strategy to choose. For agitation, a constant power input was chosen as um, the mixing and mass transfer, ca mass transfer can be maintained as the reactor volume increases. Um, when we looked at tip speed um, as a scaling factor and as an alternative, um, we saw that our engineering performance maps showed that the decrease in RPM at the large scale would result in a significant decrease in KLA. 
this would have certainly impacted the number of uh, cells we were targeting. So for this instance, power input is preferred, as it also takes into account the volume of the liquid at each bioreactor, whereas using Kip Spinner alone does not. For the gassing strategy, um, a constant superficial gas velocity was selected over maintaining a constant VVM. As alongside the um, constant power input, it would result in um, maintaining the mass transfer or the KLAO2 within each reactor system. Scaling with a constant VVM um, can result in excessive gassing at larger scales or insufficient gassing at smaller scales. A dissolved oxygen set point of 40% uh, was maintained in all the systems um, by supplementing pure oxygen as required via an automated control loop. The pH control for each system was maintained at a set point of 7.1 using a combination of hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide. Um, for this test, carbon dioxide uh, flow rate was decoupled from pH control as um, carbon dioxide, uh, we'd integrated a carbon dioxide sensor into each of the control systems. Um, our previous work with this cell line had shown that carbon dioxide was a critical process parameter and maintaining a partial pressure of 60 millimeters of mercury was optimal for this work. So the decision was made to remove this as a variable for scale up. So here we can see the results for cell growth and viability. The two 10-litre systems, represented by the two green lines, were running parallel with the two large-scale systems, the 200-litre and the 1,000-litre, shown by the red and the blue lines, respectively. Um, the same inoculum is used for each bioreactor system to remove um, this as any uh, possible cause of variability in the results. Um, as you can see in the chart, the results across the scales are very similar with the maximum cell densities achieved in each system being within less than 3% of each other and in line with our historical data for this process. Also, the growth rate was very similar for all the systems. Um, cell viability um, remained high at greater than 95% in all reactors during the exponential and stationary growth phases. So the success of um, any scale-up test is ultimately determined comparing the product titer and the quality attributes between each scale bioreactor. Um, the, the monoclonal antibody concentrations for each bioreactor showed only uh, an 11% difference across the scales. Uh, to determine the product quality, um, charge variance analysis and glycosylation profiles were obtained from clarified samples during harvest. Um, there was less than a 5% difference in the acidic and basic variants for the monoclonal. From the chart, we can see that the main glycan peak for all reactor systems was the G0F species, um, with similar trends for all glycans, uh, glycans sorry, seen at each volume. And for this particular, produ uh, particular product, um, the presence of fucosylated peaks and the absence of MANO5 confirmed that there are no major quality concerns. All right, before we conclude the webinar, we have our final polling question. Uh, question asks, to control the bioreactor, I prefer to be, and click one of the appropriate answers. I'll give everyone a few seconds for that. All right, Byron, bring us home. So in conclusion, the Paul Allegro STL bioreactor range has been designed with every step of the process in mind from easy handling and clearly labeled connections that aid quick installation and setup of the consumable to automated deflation features following harvest. Um, the unique cubicle design uh, provides many ease of use process assurance benefits while still maintaining the conventional principles of bioreactor design such as key aspect ratios and impeller type. At Paul, we have conducted extending characterization studies and have shown short mixing times and high oxygen transfer rates, which are capable of supporting the most demanding of cell culture processes while effectively stripping out excessive carbon dioxide buildup. Finally, process scale-up in the Paul Allegro STR bioreactor is aided by the large operating range for agitation and airflow, combined with a choice in sensor technology providing many monitoring and control options. 
we have shown that we have shown that results achieved from benchtop process development work can successfully be scaled up to manufacturing in the Paul Allegro STR range using well-established scale-up methods. Thanks, Byron. That was some really nice data showing the benefits of the Allegro STR system. So before we start the Q&A session, I want to remind everyone once again, this is your final chance to submit questions for our speakers. So hurry up and send them in now. We already have a few questions that have come in that look really great, but we want to encourage the audience to keep, keep them coming. All right, give us a few moments on our side to get everything squared away, and we'll begin the Q&A session presently. All right, everyone, so we've got a really nice bunch of questions that have come in, so let's get to them. Uh, Alvin, the first question is for you. One of our audience members would like to know, are you worried that the high agitation intensity will lead to cell shear damage? Um, no, not, not at all. Um, there's a, a lot of, uh, of work in the literature uh, which overemphasizes the... Um, sensitivity of the cells, uh, quite extensive recent studies, um, both with uh, uh, Genentech and with um, cells in ETH Zurich, in collaboration with a Swiss company, have shown um, energy dissipation rates three times higher than this. So um, th that's available. It not, will not often be required but it, it certainly shouldn't uh, damage the cells. Uh, and All right, thank you. In relation to the um, Kolmogorov scale, which is another question coming later, um, again, that's really dependent on the watts per kilogram and uh, is similar across the scales here. So the, the, um, the level of, of um, agitation intensity is similar across the scales, and I think uh, that there's now very strong evidence that the cells I'm not to say that all cells are like that, but certainly those results I referred to are with the most commonly used CHO cells. So I think uh, it's there, available. It may not, often will not be necessary. Um, occasionally, by test, one will dis discover whether one has a particular sensitive cell line, but um, certainly the CHO cells are very strong, and, uh, and this isn't a problem. All right. Thank you, Alvin. Uh, Byron, we have a question for you. Um, one of the audience members would like to know, what type of plastic film is used in bioreactor bags? So the, um, the film used for all the um, um, Allegro STR range is the Paul Allegro film. Um, the, it's a clear plastic film, um, and there's a full validation guide available on the exact components and the testing that we've done on that film. Um, and you know, we've subjected that film to various um, extractants, both in cell culture and severe tests, um, such as with alcohol or um, water. Um, so there's full information in the validation guide, um, which we can provide details on after the webinar. All right, great. Thanks, Byron. Alvin, another question for you. Uh, one of the audience members asked, would it be possible to go beyond 2,000 liters? Uh, well, I think that's a question really for uh, Paul uh, as well as from, from an academic point of view, uh, not at all, of course, because essentially this is still a bioreactor which is of a square shape, but in nearly all other respects, uh, a square shape made easy to use because of the careful thought that's gone into its, its layout, its ergonomics but it's essentially mimicking a cylindrical bioreactor, so it could go much bigger. Whether it can go much bigger from the point of view of people able to handle such uh, uh, large plastic bags and so on and so forth, I think is, is the open question. So from a, as an academic myself, providing um, the underlying principles in, the, in this collaboration, um, absolutely no reason, but from a practical point of view, there may well be, 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 be issues. I would expect that, that to be so. Maybe Brian would like to comment too. 
Um, I think it's it's a question of you know do you, do you is there a need to go further than 2,000 liters? Um, right now we haven't had much request to do that. I think 2,000 liters is kind of the top end. Um, if you're looking at the logistics of single use as well, sort of the the media prep operations, the buffer prep operations, um, you're you're increasing in volume and that has to be kind of moved around, connected, and manipulated in one area. And um, you have constraints there with space as well. One of the other questions I noticed was the question about going uh, smaller. And as I mentioned in passing, uh, in the early part of my talk, the, there is a 50 liter under development. And of course, the, there's no major issue with that. It's just a question of getting it uh, properly uh, tested and uh, uh, in such a way that it can be put on the market, but uh, it, it's not a big, um, there's, not, there's no particular challenges other than, than getting it well proven before it, it, it's made available. So down is oh, yeah. relatively easy, but up is a, a problematic. And uh, well, by an answer better than I can, because it's a commercial thing. All right, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Byron, a question for you. Um, do you take metabolite measurements, and if so, how do they compare across scales? So for the um, the cultures tested, we took daily metabolite measurements as well. We just didn't show that in the presentation um, because that's an important factor as well to look at, you know, um, are the cells um, metabolic pathways working the same way um, and that has an impact then on the productivity in the cell growth. Um, so we tested for lactate and we looked at glucose consumption and we looked at the ammonia profile and what we found was they were very much in line um, across all the scales. Um, we saw a little bit of variability with the lactate profile um, but that was only in the death phase of the culture where you would expect to see um, a small amount of difference there. But generally, um, the metabolite profiles were in line also. All righty. Thank you, Byron. Alvin, another question for you. It's a long one, but uh, the audience member would like to know, is there dead space that occurs during mixing with a square container? Um, obviously, a cross-sectional analysis of flow and cylinder uh, will be the same at all degrees of rotation, but is, uh, but is this not so far, uh, so far for the square vessel? Uh, do you have any data regarding this? Well, the, the, the data regarding that comes from the, the CFD of the flow patterns, which shows very similar flow patterns. Remember, there is a, a sort of dead zone behind the baffles in the cylindrical bioreactor in the sense that you get a strong recirculating flow behind that, as you do get a, a recirculating flow in the corner of the, uh, the square cross-section. But under turbulent flow conditions, it's certainly in no sense stagnant, there's very rapid exchange between that area, uh, that volume and the rest of the vessel, and that's also confirmed in the sense that the mixing time is uh, the same whether from the CFD and experimentally from the, um, the square shape and the cylindrical shape with baffles. And indeed, the, the mixing time, it should be pointed out, if you compare the mixing time in a baffled vessel with an unbaffled vessel at the same watts per kilogram, same power, then the uh, unbaffled vessel takes anything up to about four times as long to mix as, as the baffled vessel. So, the, so it, it, in a nutshell, the cylindrical and the square, from the point of view of CFD and mixing time measurements, both of which indicate whether there will be a dead zone associated with the corners, doesn't show any, and from the comparison with the unbaffled system, then the baffle or the square is significantly better, especially in relation to uh, top-to-bottom mixing. All right. Thank you. Byron, a question for you, a uh, pretty straightforward one. Um, one of our audience members would like to know, what is the molar concentration of HCl and sodium hydroxide used? Um, so the concentration of the buffers we used um, in this particular experiment um, was one molar, um, but anything from 0.5 to one molar we, we generally use in uh, all our processes. The key is to 
achieve the um, desired change in um, or maintenance in the pH set point, but without adding too much liquid where you're actually diluting the cell culture media itself. And we found that range quite adequate. All righty, thank you, Byron. Uh, Alvin, we have a question for you. I've just got to find it here somewhere. Ah, oh, there it is. Alvin, um, audience member would like to know how did the Col uh, the Kolmogorov eddy scales compare at this ver at various scales, 10, 200, and 1,000 liter? Um, the Kolmogorov scale is entirely well, entirely dependent on the energy dissipation rate. If you have geometrically similar systems, then the maximum energy dissipation rate is um, the same at each scale. So we do have geometrically similar systems. We have slightly different watts per kilogram, which has a small impact on the Kolmogorov scale, but it doesn't change it very much. So as long as the watts per kilogram that's being used is the same, which is, of course, within, in, within the range for each um, scale of Allegro, you can operate with the same watts per kilogram at the, um, at, at, at the 200, 1,000, and 2,000, so you can get the same Kolmogorov scale, and that's one of the beauties of assessing the, the likelihood of mechanical fluid dynamic stress damage um, by using different, uh, different scales but similar watts per kilogram, because the cells are very small compared to the size of the vessel, and the Kolmogorov scale isn't dependent on the size of the vessel, only the watts per kilogram. All righty, thank you, Alvin. Byron, another question for you. Um, how many additional ports are there on the systems? So um, if we look at the SDR 200s, there are seven liquid addition ports in total. Um, that's five quarter-inch ports and two half-inch ports. Um, there's the option on the 200 model as well to have a further two um, half-inch ports added as a, as a custom bag. Um, for the 1,000 and the 2,000 litre systems, there are a total of seven uh, quarter-inch ports, and there's one large one-inch port um, for um, inoculation and getting your media in. And also on the 1,000 and the 2,000 litre systems, there is the option to have um, one-inch perfusion ports. Alrighty, Alvin, another one for you. Um, why is uh, why is an up pumping impeller effective at air dispersion? Uh, don't they just push the air up and out without dispersion? No, that's that's something which people uh, tend to think if they've never uh, seen an up pumping impeller uh, doing air dispersion. It's really extremely effective, and as I mentioned in the talk, when you look at the flow pattern, the impeller, the, the, the flow patterns were obtained without aeration, but you see this, the, the impeller is pumping upwards, but there's a very strong uh, recirculation. It, it, the, the flow leaves the impeller at an angle just uh, above the horizontal, but then is dragged very rapidly down underneath, um, and as one sparges, it amplifies that flow because now the flow upwards of the bubbles is combining with the flow upwards but very much sideways from the impeller. So it sucks the, uh, the air around and it gives very effective air dispersion, much better than with a radial impeller and much better than with a down pumping impeller where the um, down pumping of the impeller is being opposed all the time by the bubbles which want to rise. And because this, the, the, everything is working in the same way, the, um, the, the flow is very stable. So now even in, la in, in very, very large um, stainless steel bioreactors for things like E. coli and so on, for, for high oxygen demanding processes, the use of up-pumping impellers is becoming very common, sometimes with a particular special um, so-called hollow blade type radial impeller, but the up-pumping impellers are, are very, very effective. All right, looks like we have a couple more uh, questions. Uh, Byron, this one's for you. Maybe Alvin wants to weigh on this too, but uh, can, uh, can entities such as plasticizers leach out of the film? 
Um, certainly with all single-use products, yeah, um, there are um, extractables and leachables, as there are with any plastics. Um, the question is always, you know, that are these components uh, in any way detrimental to my process? Um, and again, here, it just comes down to testing of that particular film. So Paul has done extensive testing on the Allegro film. It's a, it's a very tried and tested film. Um, we use it not just in our bioreactor range, but also all of our single-use bag systems. Um, so it's, it's very well characterized and all the information which can be found in the validation guide. Alvin, right. I don't know if Thank I have you. any experience. No. Uh, well, I have a question for you, Alvin. Um, otherwise, it's, uh, one of our audience members would like to know, what is the simplest way to measure and control the KLA? Well, with, with the two different questions. So the measuring the KLA, um, the simplest is, is, is to remove the dissolved oxygen and, um, and then using a dissolved, by sparging or typically by sparging, and then to use a dissolved oxygen probe to follow the uh, reoxygenation after switching to air. There are some uh, substantial errors associated with that technique when you're dealing with extremely high KLAs, the sort of KLA that you get again in microbial fermentations of perhaps as much as 800 per hour. But uh, the method is quite accurate when you're doing um, the measuring KLAs of the type that you get in, 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 in cell culture of 10 to 20, and here, of course, even at 30, which is unusually high but available for the very possibility of growing to even higher cell densities. But at those KLA values, that rather simple technique of which it's reported all the details required to do it are set out copiously in textbooks and the literature um, works quite well. All right. Thank you, Alvin. And it looks like we have our final question. Uh, it's going to go to Byron. Byron, um, audience member says, since I value safeguarding our product at all costs, uh, and are always concerned about potential leaks that could occur for, uh, from contact during insulation operation. I'm curious if those things are truly mitigated with the system. Um, yeah, it's you know that, that was one of the core drivers of um, the design of the um, Allegro systems. Um, from the market feedback we got, you know, this was a primary concern um, on a lot of operators' minds. Uh, and it's the reason why we chose the cubicle design with a distinct face. Uh, front face on the bioreactor, the whole idea being to minimize as much risk as possible with the installation. So the, the design itself um, allows for much easier folding um, of the biocontainer during packaging. And then for much of the installation step, the operator has no need to actually touch the film itself because there are specific touch points um, on the biocontainer itself. For example, in the 1,000 liter bag, um, there's the, the, the actual rigid base itself, um, and there's the, on the 200 liter, you sort of handle the system from underneath from the sparger. Um, so the whole thing was designed with, to minimize uh, any operator contact. And then when you install the system, um, because it's folded in a very predictable way, it unfolds in a very predictable way. So the operator doesn't kind of need to manipulate the film itself to avoid creases. Um, and to maximize the contact of the film with the hardware um, and therefore the, the heater jacket. Um, these factors sort of combined with um, the protective packaging that the unit comes in all minimize um, these concerns um, and maintain the integrity of the bioreactor. Hopefully that answers your question. I think it did. Thank you very much, Byron. And with that, we've come to the end of our webinar. So I want to remind everyone that the webinar will be archived on our site at www.genengnews.com for up to a year. So if you missed parts of it or want to watch it again uh, or want to forward it to your friends and colleagues, which we always recommend, uh, you can do that. I'd like to thank Alvin and Byron again for their informative presentations. And I'd like to thank the audience for their attention and very thoughtful questions. And a very special thanks to Paul for sponsoring this webinar. So hopefully we'll see you again at another Gen webinar in the near future. Goodbye for now.